Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, excited to be back home for the last uh, regular season game. I face a really talented Texas team. We're going to honor uh, 20 seniors um, in their last uh, regular season home game here. And uh, um, those guys have meant a ton to myself and our staff. They welcomed us, opened, opened their arms to us when we were hired here um, almost two years ago now. And uh, so it's an emotional time for those guys. Uh, we're going to um, have a great week of practice. Had a great uh, team meeting yesterday. Uh, guys were disappointed, obviously, in the loss Saturday um, and, and devastated uh, in the fact that we had an opportunity to win the game and just didn't find a way, didn't get it done. Uh, but uh, proud of the resolve and the resiliency of the guys to come back out. And we had a good practice yesterday, and I'm, I'm confident we're going to have a really good week of preparation. And uh, we just got to execute better uh, to have a chance against a really talented Texas team. Start here with Kellis. Hey, Chris, assuming they're still both on track to play, how excited are you to get Justin and Elijah back at linebacker? Excited that uh, uh, they get an opportunity to play on senior day. Um, and uh, they are on track to play, but it's it's only Tuesday. And uh, But uh, as far as I know, uh, Justin did practice yesterday. I think we get Eli back today. Um, it gives us uh, much needed depth at linebacker. Cody and, and Daniel have done a phenomenal job, uh, but they're playing too many snaps, and I think they know that. Uh, and uh, so to be able to split some reps there to get guys on special teams to, to help us on teams as well, it'll be a really great benefit to have those two guys back. And I know you, you said you're going to honor all the seniors, but this is an interesting time because a lot of them could come back if they choose to. Can you walk us through just how you plan to handle all those situations? Will it be like in two weeks or after a possible yeah. bowl? What will you make those decisions? You know, um, everybody may have a different scenario, a different decision, a different time frame. Uh, but we talked about it for the first time yesterday in our team meeting. And I told the guys to enjoy the week, enjoy the week with, with their teammates, uh, enjoy the game, enjoy the atmosphere um, one last time for sure and then um, take the emotion out of it. We're, we're going to wait a week. We're going to wait 10 days, two weeks, whatever we can, because some kids are going to know right away, and we'll have that conversation, and some kids are, are going to struggle with it. And uh, I don't want uh, a quick emotional decision one way or another uh, because I want to make sure that this is what they want to do. If they're moving on uh, to realize, okay, that they're not going to be a part of of Kansas State football, or if they're staying, I want to make sure they understand what they're staying for. And uh, so I, I don't want to have that undue pressure in their mind throughout this week. It's not fair to them. Enjoy the time, enjoy the game, and then we'll worry about that stuff as the weeks go by. I also had one question about Texas. They've lost uh, two key players this week to, to opt-outs, I guess. How much does that kind of change what you've seen from them on film and how you prepare um, I don't think it changes anything. Um, you know, those kids could have been or could be COVID guys for us or could be COVID later on the week for them, for us. So you, you figure it out on Saturday when you go out there, uh, like we have a number of Saturdays to say, okay, here's the lineup we have. And um, whoever's in there, uh, they're going to be counted on by their teammates and by their coaches to uh, get their job done. Thanks, Chris. Good luck this week. Yeah. John? Yeah, Chris, after having a chance to, to watch the film, how, how good of a job did Taylor Portier do being thrust in, into action there? I, I thought Taylor uh, was a, a real bright spot for us. Um, we're excited about his future just being a, a redshirt freshman. Uh, he's going to play a ton of snaps for us uh, at the guard position. And um, sometimes you find things in, in adversity. And he's a kid that took advantage of the opportunity uh, and uh, will give us great depth in there. Um, he's going to start again this week, and uh, I think he's going to get better and better. But uh, he was one guy that, uh, and I told him yesterday, I was so proud of him because a lot of guys have that opportunity and don't make the most of it. Taylor did, and he's going to play a ton of football for us here. I was also going to ask, too, just about the, the third quarter struggles you guys have had. I think it's 35 to nothing the last four weeks. You guys have been outscored there the last four games. Is there a common thread there? And just how much of a concern is that to you? Well, it's execution. That's the bottom line. Um, 
you know, it's, it's doing your job with phenomenal technique. Uh, it's having intentional focus and knowing what your job is uh, and then executing that job and, and being physical and, and knowing where you're at from a defensive standpoint. Am I the, the, the outside third, the lever player? Where am I fitting? Um, and then offensively, uh, maybe it's a missed block. Maybe it's a misread. Maybe it's a miss ID of a coverage, whatever it may be. Um, w- without question, it's, it's, it's hurt us. Uh, this year in, in some critical times that uh, um, we have to keep improving and keep shoring it up because uh, we, we need to be good in all four quarters. We can't be good in one of the four or three of the four. We need to be dominant in all four. And just for these guys, the last five weeks, I'm sure have been really tough as the whole season has, but how, how much have you seen it kind of wear on the team just going through the losing streak? Oh, it always wears on you without question because you, you're, in a couple of games, we're really close and feel like we should win the games, but we don't. And so, uh, obviously, uh, that's frustrating. And um, if you're a competitor, if you're a winner, uh, like all those kids are in the locker room and hate losing, yeah, it, it ticks you off because um, we've had opportunities. And so, uh, all that being said, you can't let it linger. And, and that's hard. It's hard for me. It's hard for our coaches because, you know, you, you watch cutups and you see – Oklahoma State a couple weeks ago, or you see Baylor in the cutup, and you're like, gosh, we let that one go. Um, but give those teams credit. They found a way to win um, because I'm sure you could look at Oklahoma looking at us or TCU or Texas looking up, saying, looking at us on a cutup saying, gosh, we let that one go. Well, you have the opportunity to win games. you got to win them. Appreciate it, Chris. You bet. Derek. Yeah, Coach. Uh, Coaches always love to eliminate the distractions, of course, in a typical season. This year, you've had to embrace distractions every single week and kind of take those head on. How exhausting has that been throughout the year since we're coming to a close? It's been really difficult. I'm not going to lie to anybody. I think it's been difficult for coaches. I know it's been difficult for players. Um, It's exhausting, but it's what a lot of us are going through. Uh, It's still remarkable to me. I I texted with Matt Thomason uh, in sports medicine yesterday. Nothing short of a miracle that we're going to get, knock on wood, a 10th game in when you see what it's doing across the landscape of college football. Uh, Even now, a little bit in the NFL, shows you the job that our medical staff, uh, that our administrators, uh, Dr. Gorl, and everybody has put in the effort to get us to this point. Um, And uh, I, I still... Somebody would have told me when I had my first press conference in here, and I think it was 10 minutes after the Big Ten shut it down and the Pac-12 shut it down, that we were going to play 10 games. I'd have said, there's no way. Uh, And we're at nine right now, and we're crossing our fingers for ourselves and for Texas to get through the next couple of tests so that we can play a 10th game. And uh, uh, that's uh, nothing short of amazing that uh, we've been able to do that despite the numbers kind of being what they were for the wide receivers in terms of yards, did it still seem to you kind of like they took a step forward in terms of just their blocking and they seem to be open more than those yards kind of said? Yeah, they did a great job. Uh, They sprung each other. They sprung uh, Malik loose, Seabass blocked the kid for 50 yards. And then on Will's run, uh, I know that uh, Malik had a great block as well. Uh, they're embracing their role. And that's a that's a play made. We always talk about make plays when you have the opportunity. That's not just a tackle or a catch or a run. Uh, that sometimes is a block. That's sometimes just keeping the keeping leverage on the defense. Uh, it could be a lot of different things. But uh, Coach Ray has done a really good job of getting those kids to embrace the fact that we, could, we can spring some big plays uh, in the run game and in the pass game by those guys making critical plays downfield. And I was really, really pleased with the progress we're making there. And then last question, the fatigue you said kind of caught up to the linebackers a little bit. Was that the case also with the defensive line? It almost seemed like that. I don't think you rotated as much there as you usually do. That was a little bit more difficult with the tempo. uh, But without question, I think we played 80-some plays on defense, and uh, a few guys went the distance. uh, And that's an awful lot of plays. And you, you, you take a game like Oklahoma State, that's a tempo team. And we were in the 60 range because we did some really good things offensively to hang on to the football uh, and to sustain drives. Uh, And you look at this game and we ourselves on defense didn't get off the field enough, which got the play count going. Uh, We didn't stay on the field offensively. And then in the fourth quarter, when we had success, it was so quick. 
know, we'd have a big play to Briley and then score quickly afterwards. And so uh, we'll take scores however we can get them, uh, long drives, short drives. But uh, uh, without question that uh, the fatigue uh, um, played a part in that for us. That's Hey, Coach. Um, Sam Ellinger in this offense, how, how threatening is it? It's tremendous because of what Sam can do. Uh, he can beat you with his feet. He can beat you with his arm. He can beat you with his mind. Um, he can run through arm tackles because he's a big physical ball carrier, um, throws the ball really well, has a lot of different people that he can get the ball to in space. Uh, and he's got some running backs that are powerful guys with a good offensive line. So um, we need to be on point and we need to be better in limiting explosive plays. And that's the thing that has frustrated our defensive players and frustrated our defensive staff. If we just eliminate um, our explosive play count that we're getting, teams are good. They're going to get explosive plays. We just got to limit the success that teams have had against us as of late. A couple screen passes last week uh, that were explosive plays. And uh, you look at the Oklahoma State game, we were doing great. And all of a sudden, they pop a run for 50 yards. We have to eliminate those things. And a lot of that is just uh, playing with great technique and knowing where your leverage is. It looked like on Saturday as the game progressed, maybe some of the tackling fundamentals started to break down maybe because of fatigue. Does a quarterback back like Ellinger make that really concerning? Yeah, and the tackling in the second half was terrible. It, it, it has to improve. And uh, the interesting thing is in the first half, it was pretty good. Um, and you can attribute a lot of that to the guys were fresh. Uh, and in the second half, and, and we don't have as many bodies to play right now. That's just kind of the hand we're dealt. Guys have to play more snaps um, than, than they're probably accustomed to or that we would want them to. Um, but with the, the amount of players we're out, that's, that's where we're at. Uh, but we have to continue to, to, to focus on the fundamentals of not only how to tackle, but where you tackle. Where, where, where's my leverage? Where can I miss at? Where do I have to send the play back to? Um, what's my correct angle to get into? All those things play a part, and that's how you give up explosive plays when you don't do those fundamental things. And your thoughts on Texas's defense? Uh, very, very active up front. Very physical up front. They don't get moved off the ball very well, and they have some really good pass rushers. Uh, and then they, they have, you know, tremendous skill kids as just far as being able to run and hit in the back end. So it'll be a big challenge for us. Thanks, Coach. Michael. Uh, Coach, uh, given some time to reflect, uh, would, would you make any uh, clock, clock management uh, changes from Saturday's game? No, we just would have executed a little bit more on both sides of the ball. I don't know, you know, when you think clock management, um, you know, that's not just the last two or four minutes. That's the full 60. And, um, you know, we just missed, fired on some plays, um, both sides of the ball. And, you know, half, if we get a first down uh, on the last drive, maybe it knocks out another couple minutes off of that. Uh, I think we had, I thought, messed dialed up some, some plays that we had a chance uh, to make some plays. We just didn't do it. And then defensively, what we got to do is stop them for three straight plays and you're off the field and we can't do that. So that wasn't necessarily clock management. It was more execution of what we were doing offensively and defensively. And it was both offense had a chance to close it out and the defense uh, had a couple score lead and couldn't hold them. And with given Will, Will Howard's uh, success and mix of, of struggles, is there a group of quarterbacks you've given him to, for comparison's sake to say, look how these guys progressed over the course of four years? Yeah, um, for starters, I, I thought Will did some really, really good things on Saturday. Uh, I, I'm excited for him and his future. Um, he's making some freshman mistakes, um, and uh, those will be cleaned up as he continues to gain experience. I was excited for Will in the fourth quarter because he made plays. He made really good plays. And in the third quarter, it wasn't Will Howard. We weren't doing everything right uh, from an offensive standpoint, execution wise, it was more than just Will, it was everybody. And in the fourth quarter, I thought I thought Will played really well and, and executed some some great drives and had some great throws. And and uh, so I'm excited about where he's at. Very similar to what Easton Stick was for 
course at North Dakota State, but Easton did it as a redshirt freshman um, and uh, uh, made some similar mistakes that, that Will has made, but made plays for us. But Easton was a year old. He was a redshirt freshman. We have to continue to remind ourselves, and I do too, and so does Mess and Colin, that we're talking about a true freshman um, that uh, uh, we're excited about uh, as he finishes up this year and, and for the future for him. Thank you, Coach. You bet. We got four hands raised. We'll finish up with those four, starting with Adam. Coach, how pleased are you with the performance of Cooper and Noah and the rest of the offensive line this year? Yeah, I think we've been up and down there, but I thought we played really well um, last week against Baylor, especially when you have two starting guards that go out on Friday that we were able to reshuffle the deck uh, with some walkthroughs on Friday night and Saturday morning. And, and we played physical and we played really well and they competed and uh, excited for those guys because uh, it's a young group that's continuing to improve. Um, but we just got to sustain that and be more consistent. But uh, uh, they know that as well. Uh, in the same respect, um, the youth that we have there and the guys we have coming back, uh, I'm excited for the future. And Coach Riley's doing a terrific job with those guys. Kellis. Sorry to have you look ahead here, but win or lose on Saturday, is it your preference to go to a bowl game if one invites you? Absolutely. We need time. We need practice time. We need development time. Um, so many guys have missed between 14 and 30 days since we started this whole thing. Um, and when you think of the guys that have missed three weeks of practice time, we're talking about just trying to get a couple weeks back. Uh, is it going to make a difference come 2021? Potentially it could, especially for those young players. And you know, we're going to practice a little bit next week because everybody's bowl eligible. But for us, it's not going to be the Eli Sullivan's and Drew Wiley's and Noah Johnson's practice. And it's going to be all the young kids going out there for uh, a brief time, hour, hour and 15 minutes and working their fundamental skills and working those guys on technique so that – we can continue to develop and, and we're a developmental program. And when you lose the amount of time that we have with these young guys, we have to find ways to get it back. And if, and if a bowl game uh, allows us to get that extra time back, uh, we definitely want to have it be a part of it. All right. Thank you. Sir. Uh, coach, a couple questions. One to reference your, uh, you know, when you started, you said no way would you get through 10 games. Um, I'm just curious. I know it's a, a fraternity of coaches, right? You don't get as much time to chat with each other as you guys do in the off season when you have all your meetings and everything. But was that shared by the rest of the coaches out there? Or was there kind of maybe a flip side of that coin where there was much more of a cavalier attitude throughout the profession that 10 games would be no big deal and maybe everyone was making way more out of this than should have been? Well, we have some tremendous coaches uh, in the Big 12. And those are the ones that I've been on calls with. I haven't talked to any other head coaches. Uh, at length, but in the Big 12, and this dates us all the way back to, to May when we first started getting together, is guys, somehow, some way, we need to try to play games. And uh, we know that the, that the quality of play may not be great, um, but the fact that we're playing games and helping, helping the country, helping our universities, whatever it may be, um, America needs football. And we even kept going on those conversations in June, July, and August when we'd have <clears throat> just the head coaches on the call. And it still came back to, guys, we got to play football games. So important for everyone that we play games. And I don't know how many we've played in league play. I know we've had a, a few canceled. Um, hopefully those guys get a chance to play those games so that we can help everybody. Uh, but uh, Without without a doubt, that uh, that was the number one goal. Everybody wants to win every game. I don't care if we'd have played six games. I hope we would have gone six and zero. Oh. We're at ability to play ten games. Uh, am I frustrated that we're four and five? Absolutely, I'm frustrated. We're four and five because we could be this record or it could be that record. But in the grand scheme of things, May, June, July, and August, nobody thought we were going to be played this many games at all. And so I, I'm proud of our league for doing it the right way. Uh, and as a follow-up to that, uh, I know I listen to you and, and other coaches, uh, you know, talk about how difficult it is. And every week, well, we're just waiting on those next tests that come around. Like you guys are all on pins and needles waiting for that. 
Yeah, we turn on the games on a Saturday, and, you know, we've heard all the NFL protocols. We've heard the $100,000 fines being thrown around on coaches. You turn on games on Saturday, and there's still numerous coaches with the mask pulled down or mask is around their neck, guys coming into the huddle that are clearly some kind of support staff. They're not in uniform or they're injured players, and they're around the huddle, and they don't have a mask on. Uh, I, I know you're not watching games as a fan, right? You're diving into your own team, and game film is different than what we're seeing on TV. But have you been – surprised and has that been is, does it frustrate you as a coach that when you're working that hard that there does seem to still be people that are not on board as we come down the stretch yeah absolutely Serena. It, it frustrates me but i'm sure somebody could picture me and say coach your mask was down too uh, i think uh, probably a hundred percent or 95 percent of us probably could have pictures where our masks are down and part of that is the heat of the moment we get that but for the most part um, I think our staff does a does a tremendous job of being diligent and having our mask up, um, and it's difficult sometimes to to coach or maybe even get the attention of an official with your mask on. You have to pull it down, uh, but I, I know that that's a three hour period that, that that people see or three and a half hour period that people see. Um, if you'd come out to a practice of ours. There's not anybody that ever is unmasked. Everybody always has their mask on uh, at our practice. And it's easy in a practice for somebody to say, hey, remember to pull your mask up. We don't even have to say that because our coaches and support staff do a tremendous job. But I think it's contributed um, to spikes on teams without question. I don't know in the NFL because I don't know they're all the protocols, but it must have. Um, but I know in college football, Absolutely. And we joke about it when we watch a cut up of a game or watching film, we're saying nobody on that side has got their mask on and look at this side and they all do, whether that's K-State or School X. Um, so, yeah, we all have to be accountable for our actions on it. Finally, you mentioned uh, the, the seniors with the potential to have an extra year coming back. And I, I know recruiting is a challenge in and of itself, right? Now you've also got the the transfer portal that's made it easier, which adds a whole nother layer to what you're doing recruiting wise, recruiting other players, right? That have been other spots. Uh, have you noticed the impact of, of what the potential, or do you have recruits that, and, and whatever access that you guys have right now, right? Uh, that are saying, well, I don't know, who do you got coming back coach? Like, you know, playing time is such a big part of it. How, how has that uh, contributed or changed or altered how you're recruiting? Um, it's not altered it, but I could see it potentially being altered uh, in the fact of, we haven't had any of our current kids that we're talking to because they're all potentially freshmen, 18 year old kids saying, Hey, is that guy coming back? Or is that guy coming back? Because I think uh, we're recruiting the right type of kids that understand the big picture that it's hard to play as a true freshman. And on the flip side, there's a lot of kids that expect to play as true freshmen. Uh, and we'll ask that question. And, and we are prepared to say, Hey, look, we may have this guy coming back, but we lost this guy at this position, or we didn't recruit heavily at that position last year because we had two seniors returning or two juniors returning, and lo and behold, those two juniors aren't in the program anymore. So I think it can be spun a lot of different ways. I know this. I've looked at it differently now in the fact of um, the, the tweener senior that you're not sure what is doing. I think you got to try to get that kid to come back because of the transfer portal, because of guys leaving the program, because of it being harder in recruiting to recruit player X that you're just meeting on Zoom, where if you've got a young man in your program that you know is doing things the right way, you, you know has bought all in, you want that kid to stay in your program regardless of is he uh, a, a first-round draft pick or is he a, a squad member because – they, they help you teach your culture. They help you uh, have an impact on some of these new kids that are coming in of, hey, this is the way you do it. And if you don't do it this way, you're not going to fit here. Thank you, Coach. You bet. Last one here, Ryan. Hey, uh, Chris, I, I just wanted to ask about the, the resiliency of, of Will Howard, given the – obviously against Iowa State, didn't play the way he wanted to two didn't even finish the first half and then start Saturday's game with an interception but then to come back later in the quarter and throw a strike to deuce for a touchdown just how I mean how resilient is that for a true freshman to be able to shake off an interception on the first drive of the game after you already had a a game you wouldn't have liked the previous week yeah that's hard and no question and and um I've always said with Will you know he doesn't let things bother him he doesn't let a negative play impact him uh, and I also enjoy Will because he doesn't get 
so overwhelmed because he made a great play. He wipes that clean and goes to the next play. Yeah, he knows he made a poor throw early in that game, um, but he also knew that this was going to be a four-quarter battle, and he came back and made some terrific throws. He makes a terrific read on the give to Malik. People don't understand how hard that is when your wide receiver is coming in full speed motion and you're supposed to read one guy to either keep it and run it, which he's done to success, or give it and let the guy go. And it's raining and it's it's sloppy out. He gets the snap, reads it perfectly, hands it to Malik. We cut down the outside uh, guy with, with Harry and route the gate. Um, that was not easy to do coming off of what he just had, had experienced with the interception. That tells me all I need to know about Will. He's such a competitor, uh, and his best football is going to continue to be in front of him. I just appreciate the fact that he keeps learning uh, from his positives and from some of his mistakes. And then, Chris, not, not that it's not been difficult on every player to an extent with the COVID stuff, but, but how hard has it been these last two weeks for Eli and Justin, just considering they are both guys who've missed a lot of time in prior years well before COVID was a thing? Yeah, especially when it's it's something where you're saying, man, I didn't get injured. I didn't turn my ankle in that game or I didn't pull my hamstring or something. I just, you know, and that's, I think what frustrates any player more is getting through a week of preparation and getting pulled out of a meeting an hour before you get on a bus and saying, okay, you can't play in the game. These kids love their teammates. And how much do you think that they look at it and say, man, I just let everybody down? whether they – I don't know how they got it or were a close contact, whatever it may be, to know that, oh, shoot, Coach Riley's going to have to reshuffle the deck. Coach Standard's going to have to reshuffle and get, get the rotation back going. That stuff's really hard, but it's happening to everybody across the country. So I, our, our kids – that's what I'm saying. Our kids are handling this really well. When you think of not having your starting two guards go on the trip, not having your two linebackers be able to play, throw an interception on the third play of the game after we just got – beat the week before pretty soundly and you're down six to nothing showed me that the resolve and the belief that our players have in themselves each other and what we're doing and we're going to get this thing done here